Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Shira Gans, and I'm the Senior Executive Director of Policy and Programs here at the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. For those of you who are not familiar with our office, New York, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, or as we call it, MOM, is the city's agency that supports all the creative sectors in New York City. But the main reason we really exist is to support film and television production in the city. So film and television production is a huge driver, not only of culture, but also the economy for New York. It supports 185,000 jobs and 81.6 billion in economic output. So we support film and television production by permitting on location production, but we also have a program which I direct called NYC Film Green. And Film Green provides a sustainable roadmap for productions who wanna reduce their environmental impact. We give strategies and approaches for how to decarbonize and reduce waste. And we also provide free resources like tonight's series, our office hour series, where we delve into different topics relating to sustainable production. So tonight, I'm really excited for our topic. We're going to be talking about how to design and construct sustainable sets. So before I bring on our awesome expert panelists, I'm just going to set the table a little bit. So I think we all know our film folks on the call today, but film creates these immersive worlds really through the sets that are designed and constructed could be dozens and dozens of sets per production. And these are massively resource intensive productions to do that. Um, from, the from, from the perspective, mostly for the studios and the producers, once that show wraps, all the contents of those sets have served their purpose and they become waste. So generally due to a lack of knowledge, timing, budget, all the things that go into what make movies so exciting, all the, all the tight timelines, there's not generally planning on what to do with those materials to give them a second life. So just to give a little bit of context for the scale we're talking about, we estimate that each New York City production sends to landfill 60 30 yard dumpsters containing 250 tons of everything that might include furniture, clothing, appliances, lumber, and on and on. So on average, there's 80 production shooting in New York City. Once you think about that, that's 20,000 tons annually that could be reused, but instead go to landfills. So today we're going to dive into this conversation about what the problem is exactly, what are the challenges, why is this happening, and what are some of the solutions to try to mitigate this impact. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists and then we'll bring them on. Or actually, why don't we bring them on and then I'll introduce them. So I guess everyone can turn on their cameras. Okay, so we have Anu Schwartz. He's an art director and production designer. As production designer and chair of the Sust Sustainability Committee at USA 829, Anu is dedicated to moving the industry towards circularity and a more sustainable future. Anu was nominated for an Emmy for his role as supervising art director for Fosse Verdon on FX, as well as receiving Art Director Guild Award nominations for Fosse Verdon, Netflix Maniac, and Warner Brothers Gotham. Philippa Culpepper is a set decorator who has been creating sets for film, TV, and other media for nearly 20 years. Having worked on award-winning projects for major studio streamers and independents, Pippa is well-versed in sourcing across all budget levels and developing both period and contemporary interior styles. Behind the scenes, her work is informed by a career of experiencing environmental policy at all levels and in multiple countries, including designing events for environmental campaign groups. Matt Denstag is the co-president and an owner of Lenoble Number, Lenoble Lumber, a family business that has been primar the primary supplier of set construction materials to the New York film and television industry since 1965. Matt has been with the company for 30 years and has focused on forging partnerships with organizations dedicated to combating deforestation, providing sustainable materials, and implementing eco-friendly practices. Denise Flinch, volunteer coordinator um, for material arts. Denise works to discover individuals and companies who may want to give back to the community by volunteering with materials for the arts. In her first year, Denise has helped to increase corporate volunteering as well as financial do donations to friends of materials for the arts. And finally, coming out of retirement just to join us today, we have Nick Miller, who's a construction coordinator. Nick has spent his entire working life building sets and scenery. Moving to New York, Nick worked in off-off Broadway and off-Broadway theater, culminating as a technical director for the Manhattan Theater Club. Moving to New York, Nick worked in off, oops, yes, sorry. Nick then moved to the film world where he was a construction coordinator for over 30 years. His credits include Gilded Age, The Woman in the Window, The OA, 
and so many more. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us. We have a very um, expert panel, as you can all tell. So I think I'm just going to kick it off with the question for the folks, I think, more in, in the production world, and then we'll get to some of our other speakers. What is the best tool strategy you have in your role to mitigate waste um, and promote circularity? I will uh, kick it to Anu first. Uh, hello, thanks, Shira. That's a really nice introduction, and thanks for hosting. Um, <clears throat> so the, the tools that I use, that uh, the work that I've done th with the committee have, have helped to develop some tools for geared toward um, art directors and production designers. And we're in a sort of unique position uh, in a film production when it comes to set construction, because we're the ones who are designing and ultimately creating the sets that are being built that then, you know, become essentially single use products and sent to landfills. So it really starts with the art department when it comes to set construction. And so there are there's a sort of uh, gap in the studio system. If you work for the studios and in, 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 uh, in making films, there's a lot of emphasis lately around creating circularity in the film industry, although we lack infrastructure. So in the absence of the infrastructure, I have found that we there are tools that we can do personally within our own departments to help that. And the things that I find that are lacking is clear directive from the studios on what to do with the sets. There's a lot of information around uh, fuel consumption and EV cars and utilizing current technologies to reduce your carbon footprint. But what I think there's a gap in understanding is that building sets has creates uh, emissions in a secondary way through the vendors that we use and scope scope three, I would say. So as a production designer, as an art director, what I try to do is utilize a sort of thought process and a culture to around sustainability because it's the only thing I really can do right now. Um, I do think that there, I'm hopeful that uh, the size of the problem is so big that we will get some directives from the studios around set construction um, oftentimes, as you mentioned at the top of, of your introduction, time uh, and money is always an issue. Um, every production is siloed, even if you work within a studio system. So you have separate budgets and productions are, can only work within that budget. Uh, whereas most major studios have sustainability uh, departments, I find it's not really reaching us at the level, at the design level, at the beginning and starting from laying out your sets and knowing where that set's gonna go before you swing a hammer. Like that is the most important thing. So again, I think I've tried to create systems. I did, I did create a document that through the work uh, the, of the committee, we've hired a consultant firm called GreenSpark Group. They helped us do some analytics and helped us develop some language around working sustainably within an art department and um i believe you have it you can drop it in the chat it okay. also is an introduction about what the work that we do as a committee and um i also think coalition building is important so our email is in there reach out say hello if you have any ideas we're always welcome to hear them so so yeah i guess what i'm hearing and i think this comes up in a lot of um just across the board in the work world is sometimes we think it's really technical, but it's really just like planning ahead and making sure that people are communicating and kind of sounds like in your role, you're, you're sort of bridging maybe studios or, or folks that some of the people on the set might not actually interact with and really making sure these broader ideas or ESG policies translate. Um, and so I guess, Nick, you're the person who then you are swinging the hammer, right? Um, after Anu has laid out this, vision so um not that they always come to fruition but what would you say are the best tools or strategies once you're you've been given this plan like what do you do well i think uh as anu said a lot of this has to do with what happens in the very beginning and i would say that my biggest tool in my toolbox for this is my position and experience 
uh, to be able to make sure that the construction budget is properly funded. And this speaks to, as we all know, an inherent problem uh, within our world that um, uh, the studios and producers lean on us to be economical. When it's time to strike a set or restore a location or anything like that, there are problems there that don't allow us to be economical. Um, and that's a very hard thing to do. So I really try tooth and nail to fight for properly budgeted uh, construction budgets to be able to do that at the end. And if we don't have it, then it makes it very, very difficult to do anything. So that's that's really my biggest tool. So, but let's say you get your budget, it's like the dream set. And then with that budget, what do you do at the end? What would that extra funding allow you to, to do when a show wraps? The strange thing is with uh, the sets that we build, um, to deconstruct them, they are built to be deconstructed to begin with. So we can end up with a lot of architectural elements, you name it, doors, windows, milled moldings, um, cabinetry, staircases, fireplace mantle, you name it. There's a lot of stuff that is there that can be put to good use on other productions. As Anu said, we don't have the infrastructure here in New York that at least used to exist in LA. I don't think it does as much as it used to, um, but we need a place to put it, to bring it to. What we do have, uh, and one of the things I relished was uh, uh, the communication that we have, even with um, producers, production managers, production office coordinators, their community bulletin boards that would announce, hey, we have a set that's coming down. Uh, we have this material. If anybody would like it, contact us. Um, the other thing, uh, which we do a lot of whenever we build a stage set, most of the time it's going to be on a deck. Uh, and a deck is comprised of two things, a floor system and the legging to leg up the deck to a certain level. Um, that material can be reused quite a bit. And that's one of the things that we encourage uh, to producers and production managers to put the word out there. And then we do it as well amongst ourselves uh, with other construction coordinators to try to, you know, reuse this stuff. Um, but I think what Anu spoke to about not having the infrastructure is a very big problem in New York. And it is a New York centric problem. Okay. So we're hearing communication, planning, budgets, uh, which brings me to Pippa. So Pippa, you're the person who wants a news kind of visualized it. Nick's built it. You're bringing it to life. You're doing all the set decorations, all the props and everything. And I could be wrong. You can correct me if that's too big of a scope. Um, so tell me what's the best kind of tools you use to, like how do you visualize circularity or sustainability when you're doing your work? There is a certain amount of circularity that's already built into what I do because when often when we're doing a drama that's character led, you don't necessarily need a want or need a set of brand new stuff. So we have a tendency to buy a lot of things secondhand. And also in the same way that Nick talks to his colleagues about who needs decking material, uh, for instance, I'm starting a show now. Over the next two days, I'm visiting several other set decorators who are closing down shows to see if we can absorb any of their stock and reuse their stock. It helps them out because it gets them out of their shop faster and it helps us out because it gives us a base layer of material to work on. Saying that every project we do is incredibly different, has different needs, different sets, locations, characters. So the the very the diversity of things that we need to acquire is is pretty great, which means we need to cast a net far and wide. Um, saying that, also what works against us and for us a lot of times is time. We have a tendency to start sourcing locally first, just so that we can get it quicker. And we don't need to send the truck out over two states over in order to pick something up. We don't have to wait a week for it to get shipped. But but also with that comes budget and New York and space. And one of the problems that New York has is it just doesn't have enough space. 
a lot of our vendors do not hold stock in New York City. We have a tendency to favor the vendors that do for mainly for speed reasons. So we know we have a short list of vendors that hold carpet, hold tile, hold electrical components that we can go to. But if it's something special, we need to go further away. A lot of our furniture comes from South Carolina. At this time of year, if I need garden furniture, I have to go to Florida. A lot of stuff sometimes comes from California. And ironically, it comes from, from the props houses in California that the studios run. So a lot of times when a studio will do a, a movie here and they want to save the sets because it has value to them, it has assets. So for, for accounting purposes, they need to keep it as opposed to get rid of it. They will put it in a tractor trailer and then they will truck it back to their warehousing in LA because they do not have warehousing in New York City. Now saying that they put it in a prop house in LA, which means I can go to LA, I can pull it and I get it loaded back in the trailer and it comes all the way back to New York so I can reuse it again. Um, and that's just one of the realities of living in a city where space is incredibly expensive. Um, yeah, so I kind of, this is, again, to the idea that we serve as some of these things are kind of perfunctory in a way, they're not as sexy. It seems like cataloging or record keeping is pretty important. Yes. Um, so when you're looking at, at the stock in LA, is that because it's all been cataloged and organized in a way that's that's some easy for you yes, to access? Yes and no. Okay. Yes and no. Like we we favor, say if we're going to a props house in LA, we're going there because we can get something there that we cannot get here. And that's the only reason why we would do that. We have an amazing network of props houses in New York City that have very valuable specialized stuff that we go to time and time again. But because of the size of the market here there's only a fraction in new york of what we have available to us in la it's just diversity of things right. the other component of that is that we have that it comes down to budget purposes as well too so say getting an artwork from a props house or a sculpture sculpture is actually a big mm -hmm. thing we get a lot from props houses because of the legal requirements for them to be licensed for us to show them on screen they have to be, we can we can license them through the props house or they are a rights-free thing that we can show on, on television. Whereas if we were procuring something, the same thing here outside of the prop house environment, we would have to do all that legal legwork and cost on the back end of that. So kind of just hearing folks talk about, it, you get to see all the different components that could get in the way of thinking about sustainability yeah. when you're clearing legal rights for a statue. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it can it can get it can get very complicated. But one of the ways that we combat that is that when we know we're starting a job, we make sure that we have adequate staff. Like for my Got department, it. is fairly large. We, we we're the largest procurers of the film industry. Like we every we do everything from light switches to curtains to carpets to furniture to the glass that goes inside the windows. So we really are responsible for purchasing, storing, and then getting rid of the largest quantity of things. Now, I'm sure in terms of if you're talking about linear footage of lumber, I think, you know, Nick and I probably have the same amount of volume. But for us, like we it's a very it's a very multifaceted um, uh, approach that we need to take. So we give ourselves we catalog right from the beginning just because of the sheer quantity of stuff that we have to manage. So we start cataloging as soon as it lands in the shop, sometimes even before we it does that, as soon as we bought it. We know where it goes. We keep records. We know where it ends up. And then at okay. the end of the job, the studio has to decide whether or not they want to keep it or we have to get rid of it. Okay. So I guess when I think about tracking, because I chatted with all the panelists before today, it brings me to Matt. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about, you've kind of the cornered the market on lumber to film and television in New York City. And um, can you just tell us a little bit about your product and why it matters and kind of how you track things? Uh, thank you, Shira. So most people have been talking about what to do after a, a show wraps, but as a vendor to the art department and the construction department it's specifically, um, we're there at the beginning, providing the material. And there's a way you can, every department can source material from the very beginning that's more sustainable than other materials. Being the lumber guy, I'll talk about lumber, which happens to be one of the most sustainable building materials that are out there. Um, as we all know, um, 
trees capture carbon and those two by fours you see on the set, they still have the same amount of carbon in them throughout their life. Unless you burn them, the carbon is always captured. So how can we make sure though that the lumber and plywood that we're supplying to these sets are sustainable? Um, there are certification agencies. The main one in the whole world is the Forest Stewardship Council, FSC. And when FSC certifies lumber, they start at the forest, that there are sustainable practices in how they grow. Um, one of the big ways are tree plantations or tree farms, which is the picture behind me. This is a sustainable tree farm. Now, of course, if you have a tree farm, you don't want them to cut down an old growth forest to build a tree farm. So how do you manage that? How do you protect that? That's that certification agency. Lenoba Lumber has been certified through the chain of custody by the Forest Stewardship Council for decades now. And that means that everything we buy that we sell as being sustainable had to be tracked from the forest it was um, produced from or the, the tree plantation to the sawmills, to the whole distribution till it goes to me. Every invoice when I'm selling something that's sustainable, it has my certification number on it. And through audit processes, that can be tracked the whole way. Uh, the point is, is that everyone, I choose to sell sustainable material and we were the first people on the East Coast to bring in sustainable Luan and other um, sustainable products that we really specialize in. But everyone on a set can have that impact. The scenic department, set deck as we, as Pippa was talking about, you can choose to take secondhand material. You can choose to take certain scenic materials that have a, a lower off-gassing material. So it's within all of our power to choose what we're selling to productions and for people in productions to choose what they're buying. Okay, um, thanks. So I guess, Denise, I wanted to bring you into the conversation. So Materials for the Arts is this great longstanding organization. It's part of New York City government. Um, you're a materials rescue organization, and you've recently started working with film and television. So could you just tell us a little bit about how that work is going? And then kind of, we can get into the nitty gritty of it, but where does this stuff go? Like, let's say everything comes together, what kind of secondary life could these, could these items have? So um, at Materials for the Arts, since we are with the Department of Cultural Affairs, um, the only places that are that can take items for now are public schools, non-profit organizations, and other city agencies. So um, when those all of those people come to shop, the items are going to um, inner city schools, theater programs. Um, so children and teens and adults and seniors can all use the materials for their theater productions, for their workshops. Um, some of these places are building sets. Some of the places are building um, whatever they need for their workshops and um, educating the city. And so how would that work? If I'm a production and I want to have materials for the arts come and help at RAP, what would I have to do and what would that kind of look like? So the producers have been reaching out to us a lot more recently now that the word has spread that we are available. Um, in the beginning, we were, get, we were getting a ton of trucks sent without warning. So we've been doing a lot to get our name out there. We recently hired two more employees that are dealing with film and television strictly, but um, usually either the production will reach out to us or we will be reaching out to the productions themselves to let them know that we're available when they wrap. Um, but yeah, when they reach out to us, we let them know they if when we can schedule a site visit. So a couple of our employees will go out, look at all of the items. And um, usually those site visits end up in a on-site shopping event and what that is is our members will sign up through us 
to come and shop on specific days. Usually it's two days and they can take whatever they like. Um, we check them out. We um, list down all of the items that they're taking. And then the next day things are, you know, put out, whatever is left will be put out and displayed. And then our members will come back and pick up whatever else is left. After that second day, we will either have a truck to take whatever's left. And um, also some productions also deliver to our members. So if there are members that would like items, but they can't carry it with them, or they, they want too much and they, they, they pack their truck and they don't have the space to pack more, some productions will actually um, deliver those items to our members directly. Okay. So I guess we talked a little bit about strategies that are productive. So we have like budgeting, we have communication. It sounds like there's actually all these communities, either Pippa kind of sending it out to other shows or people in the materials for the arts communities. Since we're New Yorkers, now we can get to the part where we complain. Um, so those were all the um, positive things. What would you guys say are your are your biggest stumbling blocks as sustainably minded um, film and television experts in your fields? Like, what's the thing that just you know, if you have like a, a few pet peeves of the things that consistently um, prevent you from from actualizing this vision of having more sustainable sets? And I don't know. I can start with well. Who wants to jump in? I don't want well, to make I'll too. jump in. One of them has always been the dichotomy between a studio's stated corporate goals and the budget consciousness of the people actually doing the production of the, you know, the producers, the UPMs, and and the like. Um, where the studio say, "Oh, well, we want everything to be sustainable." Sometimes, truly sustainable material costs a little more. So um, they're not willing to pay or there's a fight about that. So it's just that when you say one thing, but you're not willing to put your money where your mouth is, that's a pet peeve of mine. Makes sense. Um, Pippa, yeah. Yeah, and just following on what Matt says, like, and, and also what Denise was saying too, because I'm often at the end of that, I'm the one sending the trucks to materials for the arts. And a lot of times the issue we come up against is we have a limited amount of time to get out of our shop space, whether it's because the rental contract for the space is coming up or whether or not the, the show is just running out of money. Like the cost of trucking is, is significant and the cost of staffing to load, to sort the items, load the trucks and, and to send them is significant too. Now it's absolutely worth it. But at the same time, like you have to either be able to build that in your budget on the front end and still have that money left at the end, or you have to have a commitment from production to put those resources towards what we call wrap out so and that just, we, we can do we can do the physical donation. And then just to understand that, because it's not cheap to to send our trash wherever we send it, Ohio, South Carolina, um, but in the aggregate, you think it's more cost intensive to to do what you just described than just to put it in a dumpster and still ship it and pay the tipping fees and all that? It's hard to quantify without having a case study because it really depends on the type, the types of materials and also, you know, how many trucks it takes. There is a finite cost of which I don't have at my fingertips right now for the truck and for the person driving the truck. Mm. There's a finite cost for the labor, the hour, the hourly rate of the guys who load the trucks. There's a cost for the extra week that we need at, for for the storage space that we're renting. Now, job to job, it kind of varies how that balances out against the cost of carting and and the dumpsters. But ultimate ultimately, it can it can be more. Okay, and so then um, Nick and Anu, when I was talking to you both, this this very New York issue came up of art directors and kind of this idea of intellectual property and how some of the more human aspects of how we feel about our work, um, especially artistic people, might be an obstacle. So do you guys want to chat about that dynamic? Yeah, I mean, I could jump in on that. Um, uh, particularly if you're working, again, with like within a studio system and there's certain in intellectual property rights that the studio has. Um, and then on a sort of personal design level, there tends to be this notion that, you know, a designer doesn't want to use designs 
from someone else. Um, uh, so that does happen. Uh, there's also just like, uh, I think legal requirements often we come up against where a studio needs to have a sort of legal release on some items if they're s sending whole sets and that would just be more of a liability issue. Um, and, the, and again, it goes back to siloing the system. It's very siloed within everything that we do. And, and even within this a particular studio, you're siloing each production. Um, free flow of material between productions that are in the same, that work for the same studio is, is much easier. Um, but, you know, I've, I've known certain productions where if it's a sort of high concept, high design show, the designer has a desire to sort of destroy all the things because they don't want them out in the world. So that happens. I don't think that's so prevalent, but it is an aspect. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Anu. Yeah. Um, it used to be more prevalent. I think it's on its way out. I hope it is. Uh, I refer to a story that I heard from a long time ago, uh, production designer, Dick Sielberg designed a very fancy art deco elevator door. And he was in the studio where whatever was going on and got wind that it was gonna get given to another production. He turned to a carpenter, grabbed his circular saw and cut the door to shreds himself. And now I'm talking a long time ago, that was Dick Sielbert. Um, but I do believe it's on, it's on its way out. Uh, and to the point though, I think it, really needs to be, and this is something that I wish the studios would do, is to put into the deal memo that the, the work we do, the products that are made in support of the film are really uh, of the ownership of the studios, not of the designers and even the art directors. If we're going to do this, we have to give this up. And uh, I think that's, that's part of it. And people need to be reminded of that. And I grew up in a world where uh, uh, colleagues of mine, scenic artists and carpenters said, we should never recycle because we're always taking, we're only taking work away from ourselves. Again, I think that's on the wane, but that was something that I grew up with over time. And, and it has been a problem. One thing I would like to go back to uh, is this inherent problem between Studios, producers, uh, the need to be cost efficient and the need to, on my end, to properly budget things. We call our industry the film industry or the movie business or show business. It's not show art. It's not movie art. The word business is there for a reason. And I think we all have to respect that um, because uh, we're all in this business together. Where I would like to see this go, uh, and Shira, I'm hoping this is where you can help out with, there needs to be financial incentives for the producers and the production managers to be able to partake somehow uh, so that they aren't so pinched uh, with funds. And whether it's, you know, I'm not sure how, um, but if there is a way to quantify something, as Pippa mentioned, that it could be uh, then a further tax incentive, for instance, to create this fin financial incentive for us to do the right thing. Uh, and I think that's going to be a key thing in the future. Yeah. Um, so I want to, can yeah, I Denise. spin a little? Sure. jump in. So I think what's great about materials for the arts is that we kind of are that incentive for the productions. So any expense that it takes to get those items to us is tax deductible. Um, so if you have to rent out a truck to get things to us, that's included in your in whatever you're writing off for your taxes. Um, and I also wanted to mention um, that the on-site shopping will help with the problem of the shipping cost, the trucking cost as well. I mean, I just think it's it's a huge incentive for productions to use this um this opportunity 
and um just let everybody know <laughs> let everybody know about it and uh there was something i wanted to mention as well but when you asked the question okay um i knew and pippa you guys are- I, yeah i I'd, I'd wanted to add that um the the lack of uh it goes back to this idea of lack of infrastructure it's also sort of lack of messaging we get a lot of messaging from our employers around sustainability um but it often doesn't include set construction uh, and design necessarily. Um, so, and this goes, you know, to the point of what Denise is saying, which is, I think if there was clear directive uh, in the same way that we're also trained in, you know, various other um, aspects of, you know, either, you know, we have harassment training, we have, you know, then when COVID happened, we had us COVID training. And, uh, you know, the problem is so huge for, the, the climate crisis, why don't we have sustainability training uh, coming from our employers? Um, it would include vendors like Materials for the Arts and many other vendors um, that we're given, a, we can open a booklet given to us by the studio that says, this is what you do when you start to design your sets. This is what you do during, you know, X, Y, Z. When you're wrapping a set, these are the different com- Corporate, uh, these are different nonprofits you can send your materials to. It's sort of messaging that we need. And that's my sticky wicket with all this that I'm really just getting frustrated that we, we don't have, it's left up to us and the people that care in the industry, which there are many, a lot, a lot of the crew really care about this issue. And we're, we're at the end are sort of left holding the bag and we have to do our other job, by the way. Sure. Um, Pippa, yeah. Yeah, I concur with Anu. It really has to be a top-down approach because to for realistically on a logistics level, I can have my team carry out the inventory, be available. I can put extra money in the budget to make sure that we have the resources to get rid of things. But ultimately, when we, often when we get to a show, the studio doesn't really know what they want to do with the stuff. So for weeks before the show ends, we're asking, what do you want to keep? What do you want to get rid of? Because for us, in order to maximize our time, and plan, which is key, we really have to start early. But it really isn't until right towards the end of the movie or the TV show that they're doing that anyone's really thinking about it. So, because there's there are a lot of things that studios want to keep because they're of a they're of a certain value. They're considered an asset. So for they they need to keep them. And there's other and then and a lot of times sometimes it's case by case basis. They want to decide whether or not they want to ship it back to LA or whether they want to store it for season two. Right. Or if they if they want to get rid of it, and without knowing what we could do with it, all this stuff belongs to the studio. We can't do anything to it until we get directive from them. Right. So it's a big kind of culture shift that needs to happen about adding this in at the beginning and thinking about it. So I have a question for you and Anu from one of our guests. So two part question. Thinking about indie projects, and I will just pause the question to say that I think it's like 89% of film production in New York is actually indie production, which is something which makes the market a little bit more unique um, from LA, for example. Um, Would you talk about how you approach and speak with line producers who do not start the project with or sympathetic to a green agenda? Likewise for you, crew, for example, Leadman, how do you invite and control at the end of a project where everyone is exhausted and just wants to quote unquote go home? or just go home without the quotes? I have worked on a lot of indies. (laughs) That's how I, that's how I started. I was doing several, when I first started in New York city, I was doing several movies a year uh, in in order to, in order to make rent. And it's a problem because in those jobs, you really are squeezed from the, at, at, at the end for time and at the beginning for money and at the end for money too, you're always running out of both. The, biggest thing to do is for instance when we when we did an indie that was going to be bought by amazon there were certain requirements that we because they, they knew they wanted to sell it to a major streamer or a studio for distribution there were certain requirements that they had to satisfy in terms of clearances or legal clearances for artwork so if the studios say of amazon or for netflix as part of a distribution agreement made it necessary for them to have to be to have a climate audit or to have to be accountable for what for what they did within their project to be sustainable, that would be the incentive for them to treat it just like as another budget line. Like you put resources that you budget for it, you prepare for it, and you know that if you if you at the end result, if you want your indie to be seen by anyone and be distributed, that you're going to have to satisfy those requirements. 
that's right. really the only way you're going to get going to get any resources is at all if you're in my department. Oh, okay, I knew. Uh, so some of the tools that I use um, and in my everyday making decisions, uh, we we sort of have these decision trees in our industry, and it always revolves around scheduling, budget, and the creative, and we're constantly juggling those three pillars, so to speak, in our decision making. Uh, sometimes budget becomes more of a, a, a heavier weight in that decision. Sometimes it's schedule. Hopefully it's more creative. Um, and we're as, as designers, art directors, to, to, any, to, to the extent of really anyone working in this industry in a creative way, you're always constantly balancing those three factors. And what I like to say and what I feel like I've developed in my own way is to layer sustainability as a fourth pillar in those decision making. So creating in that decision tree, you've satisfied the budget, you've satisfied the, the schedule, you've satisfied the creative. Have I satisfied this decision based in a sustainable, sustainable way? Right. So on indie projects, it's it's actually there may be lack of resources, but there's lack of resources for everything. And in some strange way, independent film has this maybe more opportunity to be more sustainable because you're you're often making that choice because you don't have enough money. Um, and I think that can sometimes be the the more sustainable choice. Uh, we often, I think, everyone on this panel can attest to the working in a uh, sort of high pace environment where um, a studio project might have endless, seemingly endless amounts of money and the decisions are very fast and maybe are quick to create a, a sort of wasteful environment because you have the funds to, to make decisions uh, easier where sometimes if, you, if you're given uh, uh, less opportunity and less funds, you actually can have a better creative uh, outcome. The same with sustainability, you can get a more sustainable outcome because you're, you sort of have a lack of the funding. So for independent projects, sometimes I think that it turns out better. Now, at, toward the end of a project, that's where I think it gets harder for an independent because you're, you're, you're again, more, it's even less resources than if you were working for a streamer or a, or a studio. Sure. Um, but again, I think the tool that I've tried to use is, and I try to, I would say, again, it goes back to culture and just create that culture with the, the people that work for you and the people that you're working for. So I try to let it be known through, through anyone working with me in the creative circle, that being producers and, and um, the director, uh, I let them know that I'm going to try to make a sustainable choice here after we've discussed the budget, the creative, and the schedule. And now I'm going to layer sustainability over that. Okay. So there's a couple issues I kind of wanted to circle back to. Um, one thing I, you know, comes up and push back around sustainability is this idea of that it can be a job killer. And so I kind of wanted to delve into that topic a little bit if folks think there's merit to that or actually maybe it's it sounds to me like you could actually create jobs. There's all this inventorying. There's learning how to pack things up in a sustainable way, even just the coordination or the building the network. So I'm just kind of curious if you guys think that's a myth, not a myth. No, very, very true. Uh, the problem is money, and it's making sure that the funds are there to be able to do that, uh, whatever it is. Um, rigging hardware, which tends to be purchased new all the time because the people who use it want it to be absolutely saved. There could be systems developed to test that uh, hardware so it can be reused and sent on to another production or reused again. It's just money, really, and that's what it comes down to. Hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, um, I would say, I mean, the bigger, the bigger threat, I don't think is necessarily sustainability, but the the idea that, you know, our, the work that we do is, is, is becoming more digitized. Um, 
that, you know, that's probably obviously a, a, a bigger threat. I think there is this concept that the more the industry digitizes, the more sustainable it becomes. And I honestly don't think that's necessarily true. Um, I think there would need to be metrics done on the amount of processing uh, power that computers use to generate uh, digital uh, sets. I, I think it's enormous. Um, they, you know, you talk a lot about um, computer computing power actually using up a lot of energy. Oh, Whether that's more sustainable than building a set with a crew and raw materials, I'm, I'm not sure. Someone would need to do the metrics on that. But I think reusing, so from on a practical level, if I'm a art director or designer and I acquire a set from another production, I'm still hiring grips to move the set, still hiring grips to put up the set, I'm hiring carpenters to go through the inventory and add the windows and the doors and the millwork. I'm hiring scenics to repaint it a different color. You know, sets don't come off a truck completely built. They're libraried. As Nick mentioned before, there's doors and windows and things that are that are picked apart from a set. So there's a, a lot of labor going into just reconstituting a set that's already been built. Um, I don't know the exact number on this, but maybe Nick, you know. So sets are built from uh, Luan flats. It's a standard, either four by eight, four by 10. That is what most sets are comprised of. And it's just because it's a modular system. They can be, they can be different sizes, but standard four by eight, four by 10. That's often what we receive when a set is stripped. As far as I know, building a raw Luan flat out of pine, batten, and Luan probably takes a carpenter an hour? I don't know, what that, would you say, Nick? Uh, well, it's hard to, I wouldn't quantify it as, as little as that. Uh, I will say though that what you described, standardized flats sound more like what you would find at a commercial house uh, where you would pull from the stock flats that are there and make up whatever walls are necessary. I think for uh, most movie productions and film productions, the flats, that make up the walls, they're pretty much custom made. My experience in reusing flats uh, from one set to make another set, it's pretty miserable. The work that you have to do, it's just too much that you really want to build it new. You get a better product, you get a stronger product, it's, a lot of, it's better in many, many ways. And for that, I turn to Matt because that's where uh, FSC, products uh, come in enormously handy uh, just to be sustainable. I know, unfortunately, it's going to be trash uh, and get thrown into a dumpster. So the answer there really is forestry sustainable products. So, so there, yeah. there's, two part, there's two parts to that. The first thing we were talking about in terms of man days and man hours, uh, people days and people hours. Yes, um, there might be less construction time if um, you could use the flats that you find in a warehouse or the, the flats that have been used from another uh, production. Um, so those days might be a little less in terms of the carpenters, but then you're adding strike days because to strike a set just to throw it away versus to strike it in a way to uh, inventory it, ship it to a place, a warehouse where it can be reused, it will add days at the end. And hopefully um, you can have grips manning those warehouses and uh, putting them to work in those warehouses as well. So uh, the only people who really lose out on that, I think that the union guys, it will, it will work itself out and even out. Obviously, vendors like myself might sell less material, but if sustainability is the goal and I want to be a good steward of the planet, that is a small price to pay. But that's also Nick's other point. It's sourcing the material. So we made a choice years ago to move every production in New York to certified sustainable Luan. We knew they were using them for the flats. They were coming for, for almost 100 years they were coming from rainforests. So we did it on our own to only bring in FS certified um, Luan. 
we kept the cost the same and we weren't getting calls for it for the productions so we just switched everyone to it so there was a time we had enough stock we stopped selling the old and we only sell fsc certified luan to every production uh in the east coast basically the That's same thing Oh, go on, sorry. Sorry. No, the same thing with the battens used. Those are certified by a different agency in Europe, a PEFC. And uh, the plywood that Nick uses on those decks he was talking about, that's also FSC certified material. So, well, I can't control what happens at, after the strike. I can control what I'm going to sell to studios and make sure that it's sustainable as possible. So we're not hurting the environment. Yeah, um, at the end, that's when the whole landfill question comes in. But at the beginning, it's what can we do to provide the best possible material that is sustainable? Yeah. And so like that, ooh, I just, I want to be mindful of time. So there's a couple other things I wanted to touch on before I let everyone go. One, I just want to also note that we have amazing folks who are attending this and putting lots of resources in the chat. So some folks have been asking questions about resource guides and Everyone's putting great stuff in there. Um, so make sure to look at the chat. So I wanted to touch on, um, coming up with what Matt's saying, on materials. And this is something for Pippa kind of, or Nick, you too, you know, like, are we thinking, does this encompass, are we using paint that's not toxic? Or are we getting couches that don't have flame retardants? Or like, how far does this go when you think about the input. So thanks to Matt, we now have only sustainable lumber in New York City um, productions, but you know, the clothes like fast fashion or micro, we're all drinking plastic, right? Because um, of micro plastics and synthetic fibers and things like that. So I don't know, Pippa, could you talk a little bit about how you think about that when you're doing your Yeah. Job? So the, the things that I, I procure for sets, there's a thing that any other regular residential homeowner would get for their sets. So for me, it's mostly systemic on a much wider stage. So I've, I've, um, I've lived and I've done projects in the UK and over there, there's been a real shift because of EU law for vendors to very publicly make clear what their sustainable policy is. And they've seen that that, ma that matters a lot to, to the consumer. So it's very easy to go to any vendor in the UK and figure out if they're using what percentage of recyclable materials are you, they're doing, what they're doing in terms of their manufacturing processes, where things come from. It's all very transparent. We just don't have that information at our fingertips here. Yeah. Like I can go to one of my vendors and say, where did this light switch come from? And they're going to go, well, China, you know, right. it's going to be same thing there just isn't there is not the culture here on a national level for that kind of accountability in terms of what sustainable manufacturing processes or procurement is to my actual vendors saying that we do we do shop secondhand an awful lot mainly for budget reasons mm -hmm. for speed and also for the types of things that we need so we do we don't always buy new there's certain things that we have to buy new that we can't buy secondhand carpets is a lot of them because a secondhand carpet is often too beat up for us to use a production flame retardant now that's an interesting question because depending on what stage in what county you're shooting on in new york state they have different fire regulations and some stages require you to fire retard apply fire retardant to your sets in order for you to use that stage so that comes down to the that comes down to the actual fire regulations for the for the county. Okay. And so then Nick and I knew, I mean, sometimes I like to think about piggybacking and other policy things. So are there ever kind of health and safety regulations that come in that are a way to get less toxic products into sets? Is that something that happens? Are there other ways to prioritize that if if people don't want to pay more for a non toxic paint? Is there a way to look at an OSHA regulation or something that's coming out and kind of yeah. So, yeah, there is. I mean, uh, so 829 was pretty instrumental in health and safety. Um, and we have a wonderful um, advisor, uh, Manona Russell, who uh, has talked. To, we, we've engaged with her at the sustainability committee because while we're looking for materials that are seemingly more sustainable, she's there to check them. Uh, for human use, because something that might be sustainable, for example, um, um, so, so a product called milk paint, um, 
which is inherently completely natural, but it's actually not good for humans if it's left in a in a uh, in a canister, it could grow mold. So it's examples like that where the, the our union has already been keeping an eye on, on materials and how their impact on humans. So um, the low VOC paints we're already doing. I think paint also the paint industry has has been very good about creating low VO, low to no VOC options. So I feel like we're doing okay in that area where we are not doing that well for Phoenix department is the expendable materials that we use. So uh, brushes and um, bins and things which tend to be plastic. Um, there are a lot of different um, systems and tools being developed. Um, a lot of good people working toward this. But again, I, I don't think it's it's not, uh, there's not enough uh, education and, and training around this. And I think that's a gap that we've recognized that we want to try to do through the committee work is to educate and train our members to have better systems that would be more sustainable. But Anu, even if some of the materials you purchase can't be sustainable just because they don't exist, perhaps, you can at least make sure you're buying from vendors that have sustainable yes. practices. So that's yeah. the important thing. Research the vendors you're using to make sure that their philosophy matches yours and that they want to be in everything they do as sustainable as possible. Yeah, exactly. So before yeah. we- thing I'd like to uh, jump yeah. in on is with Matt, to his credit, not only was he the first lumber source in New York to uh, take this approach, but he managed to keep the quality of the lumber uh, first quality, and that for us uh, set builders is of a prime concern. What I would like to see more of is something called engineered lumber. The problem with engineered lumber is that it uses a lot more adhesives, there's more formaldehyde, things need to be gassed off. I think a lot more testing needs to be done, but uh, engineered lumber is saving a lot of uh, natural resources because it's basically using uh, one product is called OSB, oriented strand board in place of plywood. Now it's not uh, a perfect replacement, but it is something that can be used. Uh, I used it on decks all the time and got the added benefit that it was a better sound quality for the sound designer. Um, but things like that, I think the industry is naturally heading towards and I want to see more of it, uh, engineered lumber products. So that brings me to my kind of final rapid fire, which is if you guys each had one wish from the studios or producers and from the city of New York uh, to help you guys in your quest for more sustainable sets, what would it be? Uh, I'll go to you, Anu, first. Um, I think, uh, well, advocacy for uh, policy initiative, I think tax incentive as an ad, added value for sustainability um, would be a great incentive that the city could, could help with. I think unique to New York is the storage problem. Um, you know, there are certain case studies that, that it has been successful. You know, the, the Hollywood model of, of the, in the studio system I think was very successful in reuse. Um, and, and that was based purely on financial as well. Um, so I think maybe some storage, sub, either subsidized storage that the studios could buy in on. Um, if they'll do it, I, I don't know. I think it's a conversation that needs to, needs to be had. Um, and I think uh, in incentivizing, you know, moving towards scope three, like to what Nick and Matt are saying, it's like our vendors uh, need to also be more sustainable. And our industry is so geared toward, um, uh, you know, efficiency. We're sort of entrenched in the, in the work that we do. It's very hard to diverge and keep on budget and keep on schedule from our processes because they've been optimized for efficiency. And if you can't change the process, let's change the materials we're working with, which is what Matt has been doing. 
um, I think that would go a long way. What what the and I think the the studios or our employers could do an investment, a huge investment in that infrastructure of materials and 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 uh, research and development of the materials that we use and make sure that there's a good scope three analysis of of those materials so that when we don't have to change our process we can keep doing what we're doing and we can feel good that these sets that we're building the materials that we're using are not harmful to the environment okay nick um if i had my druthers which is a yeah. phrase that i used to use a lot if i had my druthers the dream that i would love to see uh, would be the independent film production facilities around the metropolitan area to be able to have standing sets for things like a subway station, a police precinct, a bank, courtrooms, elevators. There are so many things that get used over and over again. What makes New York so great is that we have probably the best back lot in the entire world in the city of New York itself. What we don't have is how a uh, studio facility in LA functions with storage, as Anu just said, but also things that we could, why do we need a, to build a, a subway station over and over again? It's ridiculous. They all look the same or close enough. Um, and there are quite a few things like that. We need a tank, uh, which New York really doesn't have. and. Uh, having built a few of those in my life, it's a very difficult thing. There are things like that that I'd love to see uh, the independent film uh, production facilities work on and maybe with the city of New York as a backer to be able to do something like that. The Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, I did three back-to-back -back productions before Steiner Studios there. At that time, it was owned by the city of New York. And we still were there, like, this is the place. And uh, it never happened. It could happen, but something like that would just be fantastic. Okay, that's interesting. Pippa. Uh, for me, I think it would have to be top-down incentives. Storage is obviously a big issue for me, but mostly what impacts me is the will. The will and the resources from from the networks to be able to put the time and the money into it. When it comes to my department, that's that's where where the where the trickle down. We're at the bottom of the trickle down. That's what it comes to. Um, I think without incentives to, for sustainable accountability, there's no no one's gonna have the, the it's too easy to say that you don't have the time or the money. Okay. Matt. I think incentives are great. And it not only incentives for the production companies, though, so the more sustainable you are, perhaps a higher tax credit, but it's also incentives for the vendors. I took it upon myself to bring in these materials. They cost more. A lot of vendors don't have the economic means to do that. We need a way to subsidize bringing in the right kind of materials that can be used so productions at the beginning can be greener. And to, to take off what Anu is saying, we need the city really to do something on the whole reuse of sets. That can't be left to a production. That can't be left to a, a studio. In California, it's all centralized. You have one big warehouse on the, on the Sony lot, one on the NBC Uni lot. Here, it's so decentralized that unless you have studios working together to create a warehouse, and good luck with having the studios work together, you need the city of New York or an entity funded by the city of New York to put something like that together. Okay. And then Denise, I'll let you, since you work for the city of New York, I won't put you on the spot, but do you want to give your last plug for materials for the arts and how folks in the industry can work with you guys? What's the best way? Yes. So the best way to work with materials for the arts is just um, have us in your thoughts when you're planning a show, that would be the best option then we can discuss things as things are going on and we can plan to have your items in our warehouse or have one of the on-site shopping events at your warehouse or wherever you store your items um and i wanted to answer that other question too like your wish <laughs> sure i don't want to keep you from wishing even but... though i am even though i do work for the city of new york my wish 
similar to what everyone has been saying is expanding MFTA. I would love to have, like um, Matt was saying, a centralized place where um, all of these productions can store their items, all these productions can um, get items from the storage as well, and all of our members can shop there as well. And it would be great if more than only <laughs> more than only schools and non for profits and city agencies could take advantage of the program, like artists and and the individuals and everybody. I wish everybody could take advantage of of, of reusing all of these great materials. Well, so can I just I say one thing? Oh. I'm so sorry because I want to elevate. Uh, what Denise is saying and, uh, and elevate materials for the arts because we have one of our members who has uh, talked on panels before uh, a production designer who has a great case study using materials for the arts and wound down an entire um, series uh, very sustainably and materials for the arts was integral in that process so just in the way that Denise described it earlier there was a, a set sale and uh the donations were given so again i just wanted to elevate that we have a personal case study with one of our members that it worked very well well so i wanted to wrap up by kind of reflecting a little bit of the things we heard today i think you know just really culture shift and communication um comes comes to the top of mind as well as aligning your budgeting where you put your money with your corporate goals. And I think, you know, part of that is keeping folks accountable. So I'm impressed by the number of people that registered who showed up tonight um, on my end working for the city. Uh, dream project of mine that I've been trying to get get moving forward for many years is actually a reuse and storage facility for the film and television um, industry. So that's something we are in the process now as a city exploring. Things don't move quickly in government. That might be surprising, but so that is something, though, that has kind of come off of just being a study on a bookshelf to now actively being looked at. And I think to the extent that anyone who's out there listening to this, who has ideas, who wants to work on that, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, people have been asking if we can save the chat. We're going to do that and compile that and circulate it. So I just want to thank the panelists so much. It's been a really interesting, engaging, and enlightening conversation. And I want to thank all the folks who who joined us from all over the world, it seems. Uh, it's been a great conversation. And please stay tuned. We do these every few months on different topics, and we'll be coming out with a new one soon. So thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.